I am here. Good, then let's start. Okay. Um, hello and welcome also from my side. Um, first of all, let me thank you for, for giving me this uh, award. And I'm also very thankful for um, to my co-authors, um, uh, Chi Ming, Ming Feng and Yi Xuan, uh, for their cooperation on, on this uh, very important and interesting topic. So the, the topic of, of the paper uh, is leveraging effective hashtags for ranking music recommendations. So the core question that, that is kind of underlying our research is why do we listen to music in the first place? And there's a whole line of research from psychology, from music psychology that looks into the driving factors uh, behind people listening to music. And one of the core functions of music listening to for people is they try to regulate their emotions. We all know that uh, at some points, uh, listening to happy music cheers us up. And this is exactly what this is all about. And um, so far, these functions of music have been studied um, in, in lab studies, in let's say small to medium sized user samples, simply because it's very hard to capture the emotional state of users. And this is um, the, the, the core problem that we, that we are facing in, in, in music emotion research basically. And what we try to do is we try to come up with a, let's say different approach, a more data driven approach simply by by relying on social media to, um, to gather a data set of um, listener reported emotional context information, basically. So for the Rexis community, obviously uh, emotion, the current emotional state of users is context information. And this is also what we want to exploit in this work. So what we did is we basically looked into the use of um, so-called now playing tweets. So you see an example uh, right there on the screen, uh, on the screen where somebody listened to Crazy For You by Adele, and it seems to make um, them happy. And this is what we call now playing tweets. And this is also the database is underlying our research. And these user reported emotional states is also the context input and the effective context that we want to exploit in our uh, research. So uh, the core question and the core goal of this research is to investigate the impact of such effective contextual information at large scale uh, in music recommendation, trying to kind of, um, you know, fill some of the gaps that, that still are there when we look at, at lab studies. And to, to make it the goals more concise, so to say, um, we had two questions. One was, how can we use this effective contextual information to improve recommendations? And particularly, we were looking at a, a, a ranking task. And the other one is, let's say, from a more computational side, how can we actually represent this information? And uh, these are the two core questions that we try to answer in, in this work. So let me shortly walk you through the methods that we used. Um, obviously, I will briefly walk you through which kind of data that we used, the data set that we created, how we gathered and extracted this effective information from those happy hashtags, how we represented all this information, the ranking procedures that we uh, introduced, and how we designed the experiments. Now, as for the data that we used, uh, we crawled now playing tweets from Twitter, and we came up with two different data sets, the NP560K, simply because it contains 560,000 tweets, and uh, a smaller uh, data set uh, holding 90,000 tweets. Why did we use two data sets uh, of now playing tweets, containing now playing tweets? Simply because when looking at the statistics of the, the larger data set, we saw that um, some of the, let's say, dimensions of this data set were highly dominated by outliers. And um, uh, therefore, we um, created the second smaller data set by simply removing all users that had more, than, more tweets uh, than the 99th percentile. This also gives us a chance of 
investigating the impact of such outliers on, on the uh, performance of our ranking uh, procedures. So these are the data sets and after all the filtering uh, steps and so on, uh, we are still, let's say, looking at a decent number of, of tracks artists and users contain. And um, how did we gather effective information from these tweets, from the hashtags in particular? Uh, here we, we took a, a rather simple and uh, uh, effective approach. Uh, we call, uh, uh, sorry, we used um, sentiment dictionaries. And sentiment dictionaries are simply dictionaries that, that map a term to um, a, sen a sentiment value, sentiment score, being either between, mostly between minus one and one, minus one being sad, one being happy. Yeah, so you already see this is a very simple way of modeling uh, sentiment, a one-dimensional way of modeling sentiment. And we have experiment with a couple of uh, quite uh, popular uh, sentiment dictionaries that contain different terms um, and, and do have different coverages of, of, um, for our data set. But I will get back to that later on. So the, for me, the core question was, how do we represent all that data? So we have tags, we have tracks, we have sentiment, we have users. Um, how can we model that? So um, what we did is we modeled it as a graph where we linked users, tracks, and hashtags. We have experimented with a couple of different topologies for the graph, uh, but this is just an example for you to get the idea. And what we then used is some graph embedding technique. Now, this paper has been in the making for, for some time, and it also took some time to get it published. So back then we used DeepWalk because it was state of the art back then. Nowadays, obviously, you would use some, some graph convolution approach uh, or, or uh, similar approaches to get or compute the embeddings for tracks, users, and hashtags. But essentially, what this provides us, and this is the, the core idea here, is um, a vector representation of lower dimensionality for users, hashtags, and tracks that also allows us to directly compare uh, users and tracks. So suddenly we are able to compute the similarity of a user to, for example, a track. And this is also the core input to our uh, ranking uh, methods. So for our uh, ranking, um, as I said, the core input is the vector representations of, of users and tracks and hashtags. Uh, if you consider this example um, graph here, uh, what I also added is the sentiment values that are extracted from the, these hashtags. And now we have a couple of different options of, um, on how to actually rank a list of tracks for a given user in a given context. For example, in the most naive um, uh, way, we could simply use the similarity of the user and a set of given tracks and rank the most similar track to the user at the top of the list. Now that we have a graph, we can also use the, uh, a transitive, a transitive um, relationship between hashtags and tracks. For example, we can compare the hashtags that a user has used to the hashtags that are assigned to a track. Again, comparing the vector representations. Or we could go even one step further and use the sentiment values that are assigned to a given track to the uh, hashtag, the sentiment contained in the hashtag of the current input tweet. So you see, we have a couple of options of what we can compare and use for ranking uh, for um, for ranking a list. And this already brings me to the experiment design. What we did is we we tried to design an experiment uh, experiments where we um, did select one positive tweet. Uh, for of a user. Uh, this includes the track, the hashtags contained, and the sentiment contained as input. And then we add nine negative samples to fill up the list. And then the goal was to obviously to rank the positive um, track on top of this list. And um, we came up with two different ways of, of sampling uh, negative um, 
of ne negative samples to, to fill the list. One was the, the random population where we simply added nine random tracks. Uh, uh, this should be an easy task for the, for the ranking methods. And what we wanted to show with this experiment is basically, can our system capture the general listening preferences of a user? But what we are more interested in is uh, how much can the effective context contribute to this ranking? And therefore, we added a second experiment where we not added, didn't add nine random tracks, but we added nine tracks that the user has already listened to previously in different emotional contexts. And this experiment should show uh, that we do require this effective context specific information to do the ranking task, uh, to perform well in the ranking task. And we consider this a way harder and more complex task. Um, so as for the results, we did a couple of experiments, but I'm only going to focus on, on the major findings basically. So what we did is we looked at the mean reciprocal rank simply because as I said, the goal was to, um, uh, to rank the positive tweet um, track on top. And so what is the most important finding? So for the easy task, the general listening preference of the user, we see that um, comparing the, the vector representation of a user to the vector representation of the track is already sufficient and performs well um, and receive, uh, achieves the highest mean reciprocal rank. Um, what you see here is the different graph topologies that we have um, experimented with. Um, and you see, we do not even need to include um, hashtags and hence context information in the graph to obtain these results. However, for the more complex, more personalized uh, task where we uh, try to rank tracks that the user has listened to, all of those tracks, here we see that we need to include context information in order to perform well. So what you see here is um, these are the similarities or ranking methods that do not include any hashtag or sentiment information. Then we have a set of uh, similarity and, and ranking methods that do include um, the tags attached to tracks and tweets to represent either the user or the track. And uh, what we see down here is uh, the use of sentiment information in the ranking. And what we see is all the methods that contain context information perform well, outperforming the others by, by a large margin. And this is also the main takeaway from, from this work. We do need context information for personalized um, ranking of recommendations in such a um, effective context. Um, recommendation scenario. So uh, obviously there is a couple of limitations to, to this work. One is the data set is only, collect, only collected from, from, from Twitter. We are faced with only implicit feedback. We do not know more about uh, the user liking a song or not. The emotion extraction method is rather simple. And also the, what we do is for the similarity computation, we average um, vector representations, which is also, uh, I'd say, subject, subject to improving, improvement. Um, but in general, what are the takeaways? What did we find? For me, the most important finding is that there's a huge difference between um, a, a context-specific task and a non-context-specific task. And for the effective context-specific task, we do need uh, to incorporate this effective information in order to perform well in this ranking task. And this is uh, the core takeaway from, from this work. Again, thank you very much for, for this uh, award and I'm happy to take any questions. So, thank you. Um, so, yeah, the, um, the, the, the time is almost over, so do you, um, but very briefly, so how would you model emotions now um, in, a, in a more higher dimensional way or? Yeah, so as I said, we used a one dimensional way of modeling it. Um, there are more complex models. Uh, valence arousal is a two dimensional model that is used quite frequently. Uh, and there's also uh, even more higher dimensional ways to model um, uh, 
emotion. For example, the GEM scale uses a, I think, 47 dimensional way of, of modeling emotion. And this is also something that, that we like to improve on to get a more complex way of modeling and capturing and, and, and incorporating emotion information. Um, thank you, Eva, and um, yeah, congratulations to all um, who um, got the award today, and many thanks again to NVIDIA um, who made this possible um, due to their donation. And uh, as I said, there will be an award also next year, so if you continue the work uh, on this and, and have a journal paper, we will have a call again um, yeah, some months before Rexis. And, um, also, uh, thanks to the general chairs of, of Rexus who gave us also the, the chance to um, have this session um, yeah, um, within the, the, the regular program. So, um, yeah, that's it. And now we come to the 